Hello, I'm Emile Bellet, founder of Vespod and author of You're Not Broke, You're Pretty Rich. Welcome to The Wallet, and our seven-episode mini-series where we take your most pressing questions to financial advisors. Money is undeniably an important tool that gives us the opportunity to live life on our terms. But when do we know when enough is enough? How do we strike a balance between our well-being and our income, and how we can live a fulfilling life without excesses? In this episode, we speak to Helena Wardle, founder of Money Means, as well as partner and chartered financial planner at Miss and Wardle, about finding that golden balance between money and our well-being, how to avoid lifestyle creep and still feel fulfilled, the best ways to avoid retail therapy, and more. I'm often asked, how do I find a mortgage broker, financial advisor, or an accountant I can trust? In a world full of chaos and noise, it can definitely be tricky to know where to turn. This is where Unbiased comes in. Unbiased is a matching service that helps to connect you with the most experienced and regulated experts. Essentially, they do the work of finding the right expert person for you. And the best bit? It's free to use. Visit unbiased.co.uk today and find your match made in money heaven. Remember that we are not certified financial advisors. Information shared in this podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. So I just wanted to start by asking you how can financial wellness or actually the lack thereof affect your health? Or physical well-being? It's a really interesting question because when we think about what keeps us healthy, we normally think about the food we eat, the exercise we do, the time we spend with people. And so much of that's actually linked to money. If you think about it, it underwrites all of those important elements in our lives. And when we don't look after that, we cause ourselves worry and stress in a way that really undermines those other important elements that, that we value. And I think we need to shift around how we think around money in our lives in a way that can incorporate more those elements of like how we eat well, how we exercise, how we take time out, how we relax. Those are important things that we know we need as people. Um, and money has got the same sort of influence because if we're able to look after our, our finance as well, we have more time to think and headspace to spend in the stuff that actually really matters to us. And I think that's how I definitely think of um, financial well-being. It underwrites the other elements of our health and well-being. How do you find that this balance between, you know, wealth and well-being uh, in, in your life? It's interesting because um, I think the fact that we always try and balance stuff is maybe um, part of the problem. And I think we need to accept that in a way, um, our wealth is a, is part of life admin that we have to take care of and that we have to be mindful of and, and spend some time and attention to because it, it gives us opportunities, it, it gives us security, it helps us take care of the people that we love and it's a massive force in our lives. So it is, it is an important thing to be mindful of and be aware of and I think the biggest mistake I see people make is um, we stick our heads in the sand. We don't face it. And and I think that's when it really causes problems for people. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I, I see this procrastination and then, you know, after actually not tackling your finances for years, you feel like I'm, I'm really bad at managing money and then there's all these beliefs. But, you know, I mean, th this lack of maybe confidence around around managing finance, do you know where, where it actually comes from? I mean, if you're talking to some of your clients, do you manage to get to the, to the root of it? The starting point that I've definitely seen is that um, as an industry, financial services has not helped because I hear I'm not stupid, but from incredibly clever people who has no reason to feel that they should they, they shouldn't feel the shame they do around money because ultimately we have to accept that it is a complex thing. There's incredible amounts to it. And actually the, the, the best starting point is accepting that we all know how to drive cars or most of us know how to drive cars, but we don't have to know how to build one. And I think we need to approach money in the same way. What is the level of information you need 
to make a good decision. And it's not always understanding everything under the bonnet to the sense that you won't be able to make a decision. So for example, if you want to invest, there's investments that pull it all together and spread your money. And that's a good decision to make if you don't want to be spending time watching stocks or doing things like that. It doesn't have to be as complicated as as it's made to feel. And the other thing I've really noticed is that people don't see what they do well We all come from different perspectives. We have different upbringings. We have different elements that we bring to it. So we're all going to be unique in our approach to money. And I always find something good in whatever someone's doing. And I think that's actually a really smart move or that's a really clever thing to have done. And I think um, people don't see that in themselves. We, we We don't notice that. But there's an enormous amount of things that people do that are really smart money moves. And, and actually, we beat ourselves up too much about it. It's an emotionally complex topic that has really, really got too much information. So it's okay to know that, that actually it is hard. But like anything hard, you need to start small. And if you start small, you'll build your confidence. And I think that's the key. And Helena, I mean, it's something that we did in one of the, the podcast episodes. I asked one of my guests, you know, well, how much money do you actually um, want in in your life? And I think a lot of people try to think about, you know, what is this number? How much money do you really need to live a a fulfilling life? What is your your take on that? What's your approach? (laughs) I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I think it can be broken down in a different way because, yes, having... um, a sense of understanding what you need is important. But the reality is nobody would know exactly. And the enormous amount of people that that um, there's been studies on people at the end of their life and sort of look at what's important to them. And they don't talk about what's in their bank accounts. They talk about the no. time they spent <laughs> with people, the things they did, the experiences that yeah. life gave them. And actually, if we break it down to that, I think what I think is the most important thing is that people need to be mindful of what is important to them. What is unique and what is what is actually going to be the things that you want? Is it knowing that you're secure and safe, that you can cope with things that's thrown your way? Is it knowing that you have money to take opportunities that come your way, whether it's going on a massive, amazing trip or whether it's starting your own business because you've got that security behind you? It's personal to every single individual. And in all elements of your money, you will find something that you need to compromise on. Because if those elements are important to you, then you might have to think, okay, actually, then I don't want to be spending money or time here. Because I think what people confuse sometimes is we earn our money, don't we? So actually, ultimately, it's also linked to our time. So how do you want to spend your time? What is the things that you think is important? And to some people, it's not retiring either, because some people love their work so much, they can never think of giving it up. And I think that's why it's an incredibly complicated thing to answer. It's incredibly personal. And I think what helps is being asked good questions. And good questions will always make someone focus. And the minute you have something that you're aiming for that's very unique and personal to you, I think you're far more committed to it. Another aspect of maybe, I mean, of something you're working on with with your client is around understanding maybe this number or how much money you need in in your life and thinking about, you know, a a cash flow model um, and how that will impact, uh, you know, your your financial planning. Can you take us through this this process and for people to to start like looking at their their numbers, maybe with like a different approach? I think what... um conversations like that with clients help people do is understand what if so they Mm -hmm. understand what if I do this what if I do that Um, and make informed decisions of painting the picture it's the same way as when we are looking to go somewhere it's good to understand the direction you're heading at you'll look at a map or you'll try and do it on sat nav whatever that is you want to have some sense of direction so you understand how long it will take you to get there and what you might need to do to 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 achieve that journey and i think financial planning is is very similar to that ultimately what we do with clients is sit down work out what what actually will be um mean they're okay so am I doing okay am I saving enough have I got enough will I get to where I would hope to be and accept that that journey is not straight because we might think now in 10 years time we want to do this you get to that point and then you realize actually that's not that's not what I want to do and that's okay it's understanding that that um what you want to try and put yourself in the best position 
And that's what cash flow planning does. It helps you see what's your gaps and what you can do to, do, to, to mitigate that. And the reality is very simple. If you are short of what you want to do, you either save for longer, you save more, you take more risk or you lower your expectations. That's generally the, the main outcomes for people. The take more risk one is a very difficult one to balance because in some cases you'll never be able to achieve that. But that's the reality. If someone is saving for their future for 10 years time into something that's below inflation, then they're going to have to save more to achieve that objective. That's that's the reality of it. And what cash flow forecasting does for people is really help manage that expectation of what could that look like and paint the picture so you have a clear idea of what you're heading towards. And I think that's a brilliant way to visualise what people um, need to do and what difference the actions make, but never marry yourself to that plan because it won't won't go the way you want. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's the that's the complexity of it. It's a it's an idea and it's a direction and it's clarity, but it's not something you should think will definitely happen because the likelihood of it is is low. And I love the link between um, you know financial goals or like the, the the journey actually not necessarily financial goals like goals in life and how you then money is going to be this tool that will you know support you in your in your journey and I feel you know listening to and talking to a lot of people about money I think one of the main fears is actually running out of money but often that's not actually going to happen so how do you make sure you know you have this plan you have these numbers and that gives you the confidence that you know if you make these choices that 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 should be like the likely um outcome but i just want to come back to to one thing around money and and happiness we've seen a lot of you know studies we've had a lot of conversations around that do you think we downplay or overhype maybe the importance that money plays in our in our happiness or does it become a matter of always wanting more? That's a really interesting question. Um, and I think there's, there, there's two elements to it that I think is really important. To some extent, not having enough money will always make you unhappy because if you can't cope with your basic living costs and needs, then that's a really difficult position to be in. So I think we're almost frivolous in how we talk about this at times. But in terms of the short term hit of um, spending money on something that doesn't matter to you, I think it's empty. And I, I think that kind of um, spending is always masking um, something that you may be doing to get a short term hit. And I think There's a level of awareness that needs to be um, had around that. I think comparison is dangerous. Um, I've also spoken about the fact that I think it's incredibly um, individual. And I think we we are too quick to compare um, our situation to others. And I think sometimes we're not respectful enough of our friends and, and colleagues and the pressure we place on people to to maybe you know stay for another drink if they don't if they're trying to watch what they're spending um i think we do need to respect that people know best for their situation and and they can make choices on that in terms of happiness i think there's elements that um it brings us contentment i think to an extent not happiness because if you have the opportunity to go out and do something that you enjoy and spend time with your friends if you have the opportunity to have an experience and fund it then yes of course I think that does um that does help people live a good life and live a life that they're happy with but um there's so much research around over a certain level of wealth it makes very little difference and yeah. I think that's quite yeah. interesting because um the things that we genuinely appreciate and enjoy doesn't always cost the most. And I think that's where that, what is, what matters to you individually and connecting with that, I feel brings people more joy and, and happiness um, around money than, than just um, what they spend it on. Yeah. And I love what you said about, yeah, I think individual choices and, and comparison and, and often where, you know, we're chasing these things that others are chasing and we think it's the solution to our problems and that, that we'll be happier if we have this and that or, or more money, but actually it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, and, and, and another, uh, you touched on like behaviors a little bit and something I've seen over and over is, is this lifestyle creep. Um, and 
what is the so I'd love to talk about that a little bit is it something that you see in your in your clients and how do you uh, open the conversation about that and and make sure you always live below your means I mean that sounds like very basic but for me it's like the number one rule in in personal finance um but it's not always uh, that easy because we know the mindset like plays a big role um into into our financial decisions I think we talk about the way to manage this in a really negative way. It's budgeting, it's looking backwards and and looking backwards or, you know, trying to see what happened in the past can sometimes cause shame or make people feel like it's impossible. I think it's far um, better for people to, to understand um, and be mindful of what they're spending on. And it does mean you need to look at it. So have, create a spending plan. What are you prepared to spend a month on certain elements? And if you are overspending, you're going to need to compromise and understand what 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 is your options. Because if you are spending more than what you've got, got coming in, you're going to land in trouble. And that's not a great place to be. Um, so you have op- options. And I think not all options are open to everyone. And we need to recognize that as well. Because if you if you want to maintain that lifestyle, you need to find a way to fund it, i.e. earn more. And that might mean you're sacrificing time. Is that what you want to do? And I think it it does come down to really looking at personally what is important to you. What do you have to pay for? Because we don't have a choice. It's some fixed cost that everyone has to spend a month to um, live. And that, that's not movable. You can move the dial a little bit here and there, but it's not really going to shift that much. Um, shopping around for things will matter, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to really work what's going to help you achieve that principle of living within your means. Where you can really move the dial on things like that is to be mindful of spending that doesn't matter. So where are you wasting money because you, A, don't plan ahead, B, don't think about it, or C, you kind of not paying attention um, and I think it's so much easier nowadays because everything's on a card. You don't even see the amounts. You just tap your phone and job done. You've spent you know, money. And I just think that make, means that our, in our lifetime, we're going to need to be so much sharper on that because we don't have the opportunities to stop ourselves in the way that you did before, i.e. put your card in, enter your pen, see the amount you're spending. You just don't see it anymore. And I think I think that makes it much harder. And it, it is something that People need to create habits around to to look at or review and actually also be mindful that it's not beating yourself up with a stick moment. It's a being aware moment and trying to think, OK, how can I make a change that I will stick to? And one thing that really has worked for me um, personally is is trying to break it down really small. OK, what will I commit to this month? What will I know I can definitely stick to? So, for example, I know I can stick to only having one takeaway a week or whatever. I, I'm using silly examples, so forgive me for that. Um, what do I know will be a challenge? So what do I? What can I set myself that I know, actually, if I achieve that, I'll feel really great. I know that's not what I want, you know, spend money on. I didn't like seeing that on my statement. And set yourself that challenge. And what will be, like, really crushing it? So break it down in three steps. So if you achieve step one, you still achieve something. Because I think sometimes you go for a month and you look and you think, oh, gosh, I can't believe I did that. And then that feeling of just negativity doesn't help you move forward, I think. And uh, and thank you. I think that's super helpful uh, in terms of yeah, looking at you know, what you're doing today with your finances and try to think about you know, what can improve. And these are very small improvements. There's some easy wins, maybe, you know, on some, you know, subscriptions and bills, even if at the moment, of course, with inflation, it's it's getting really tricky with higher interest rates. So you may feel like your budgets are really squeezed. Um, and also in terms of uh, other habits, something we, we often talk about is around impulse spending and, and, and maybe retail therapy. Do you have a few tips um, on this, on how to maybe recognize it and and, and start, um, yeah, ta- tackling it if if you want to, if if that doesn't bring you joy, if if you're spending too much money, um, that would be great. I think um, the minute you feel guilt or shame about something, it says something to you. So if you're looking at your spending and you feel bad about it, then I think it's worth working on. Um, And I think there's a level of self-awareness that's needed around that. So um, there's different elements. I think 
if it's a really serious problem, I would strongly encourage someone to work with a really good financial coach. And I'm not talking about people that will explain money to you or not qualified. I'm talking about people like Simone Gesson. I'm talking about people like Martha Lawton, you know, Emma from Money Whisperer. They're proper coaches and they can really help you identify why you're getting stuck in that habit and how you can work through it. And it's mindfulness and it's trying to think about, okay, journal about how you're feeling before you did that, why you did that, what caused you to, um, what are you avoiding? What are you trying to to feel by by spending in that way because if you're feeling bad about it afterwards then it's not helping you it's helping you in the moment but not long term so so I do think it's complicated um I think sometimes people as their income grow they their spending grows because we kind of feel like we deserve it or or we um it's something that that we can afford to do so why not and I think there's an element of truth in that you work for your money as long as you feel like you're spending your time well i.e you know, you're you're exchanging time you spent working for what you're spending money on, then I think that's that's fine. Um, but if it becomes problematic, it's definitely something that's worth working on because it will cost you so much in the long run. Um, but it's also being kind to yourself because it is difficult and it's things that we are um, sometimes conditioned to culturally. There's a very commercial, you know, everything's geared towards people buying more and things like that. And I think um, going against that, is quite difficult, but it will benefit you in the long run. So I, I do think it, it's worth working on. I received a question from, from someone from the community who was asking about careers or making money um, and, you know, if what happens if you don't like your, your job. So I'm gonna, just going to read this question for you. Some of us end up suffering burnout or simply stop feeling fulfilled by our careers. But there is also a fear of being forced to change lifestyles. If you do quit, change careers, do you have any words of advice here? And I know also for you who change career, who are, you know, building a business and it of course happened to me switching from, you know, finance to being an entrepreneur. These are really, you know, tough challenges in, in, in our life. And there may be a lot of, especially for women, I feel a lot of other, you know, challenges. It's, it's definitely not a linear path where you're going to earn more money every year. So how do you, do you address this? I think the fact that they've asked the question is such a brave thing to do. Um, I've been privileged. I've worked with people, you know, for 13 years, sitting down with people asking themselves those questions, you know, people getting to the end of their career and thinking, how do I slow this down? How do I change this? How do I give myself op options? So it's a really, um, it's not an alone question. It's a very big one to tackle. I think um, to me, I value my time more than money. Um, I value what I do. I value my contribution. I value um, the things that that matter to me. And, and I'm lucky work is 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 it you know to me that's it's a really big part of my life and who I am as a person so I've always found it interesting when it doesn't um it's not called to people's decisions around um what they spend their time on but then I've changed my mind on that when I've met people who work to fund the things that they love so I think you are very brave to think that and to work through that I think there'll always be compromises when you make change. And you'll know this. We're both in the same boat in that. You compromise a stable salary to become an entrepreneur. You, you take risks. But the one thing I have learned in my life is when things are uncomfortable, I always get the best out of it. Because that discomfort tells you something. It tells you it's important. It tells you it's something you should address. And I've never regretted it. But it doesn't mean it's not hard. Any change is hard. Any movement from you know, what you know and what you're familiar with. What I would always encourage people from a financial point of view is really look at the numbers and what it will mean to you. Try and play out the scenarios. Now, when I say look at the numbers, people think massive analytics spreadsheets. Be simple. You know, there's net pay calculators. There's ways that you can find out, okay, if I earned this, what does that mean? What do I need to compromise or, or provide for myself to be able to do that? And I think it's a beautiful thing to choose what you spend your time on. Um, so I would, you know, I think, it's, uh, I, I definitely think I've seen people come out of it better, you know, giving up really high flying careers and, and saying, actually, I've done this for enough time now. I don't want to continue. Um, and, and that's okay. 
you know, we're all different and what we want is different. Some people really want to continue with those challenges and other people don't don't want to choose what's more important for them. And I think it is very individual. Um, so working out what it might look like will definitely help. Um, and that's that what if scenario I spoke about earlier. And you can put your own together um, with the tools and resources that's available on the internet. Thank you so much, Helena. Um, do you have any final tip on um, money and, uh, and well-being? I think um, we do need to have a culture shift around it. We, as humans, did create the concept of money. <laughs> we kind of have to remind ourselves of that. So um, the fact that it does actually have such an emotional attachment to so much in our lives says a lot. So not only do we have a complicated topic that's got loads of nuances and loads of complexities to it, we also have a topic that's massively emotional. So accept that and understand that it's normal and that that's that's an okay thing to, to work through in your own time, but small steps will make a massive difference and it's not quick. So the it, the 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 compounding impact of the differences you make today, you will notice in time. And I've had the privilege of seeing that by working with clients, mostly that that's sort of over 50. And that's why I'm on such a mission of money means because more people should access that, that concepts of, of helping themselves in, in that way. So people are doing better than they think. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning into this episode of The Wallet. We understand that discussing money can often be viewed as taboo, but we strongly believe in the value of sharing knowledge with friends as a meaningful way to give back. Be sure to click and follow The Wallet on your preferred podcast platform so that you don't miss next week's episode 6, which will be airing next Thursday. In this episode, we'll talk about inheritance and protecting your money. If you enjoyed our show, we would greatly appreciate your support by leaving a 5-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Lastly, make sure you join our live webinar on financial advice today, where we'll explore the ins and outs of working with a trusted advisor. You can sign up for free via the show notes or on vespod.com. And if you missed it, don't worry, you can head to our YouTube channel at Vespod to watch the replay. <laughs>